podcasting Q&A for November 6th, 2017. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the audacity to podcast.com. I've got a lot of questions lined up from you listening, and you're welcome to participate. If you're watching this live, then comment below this video with your own podcasting question, and I can get to that. Or if you're watching the replay of this, then email your podcasting question to me through the audacity to podcast.com slash contact. And make sure you're subscribed so that you receive notifications of these new videos, especially if you're live uh, or if you want to watch live on Facebook, then go to the audacity slash live Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern. First question comes in from Kylan Hurt saying, any experience using moving blankets as sound absorbers? I've got these giant obelisks behind me. Well, not so giant, but they are they are big. These are acoustic panels, and uh, there are acoustic tiles, acoustic panels, uh, blankets, all kinds of different ways to solve a basic problem, and that's reverb. Reverb is when it's a kind of echo. It's not a. It's not technically an echo where you would hear yourself back. So if you say echo, and then you hear back echo, 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 that kind of thing, that's an echo. A reverb is where the sound that does, well, bounce back or reverberates off the nearby surfaces does so, so quickly or so close to the actual thing that was said that you don't hear a distinct repeat of that thing, but instead you hear some extra noise, like go into a stairwell and yell or into a parking lot or a stadium or an empty auditorium or your bathroom or certain rooms in your house, a kitchen or a restaurant with hard floor versus soft floor. These are all places with different qualities of acoustics and reverb. So sound reverberates off of all surfaces or nearly all surfaces. And sometimes that makes its way back into the microphone. So there are different ways that you can try and treat this. One thing, by the way, to help reduce this is simply get closer to the microphone. Because if you're farther away from the microphone, then the microphone has to be more sensitive. And if it's more sensitive, then it's also picking up things that are farther away. I'm not explaining that properly. It's also picking up more within this bubble of sensitivity that you've increased. See, when you turn up or down the gain of the microphone, it's like you're adjusting a bubble around the microphone, not that it will only capture sound that's in that bubble. That's a misconception. It's that bubble is the optimal size, or that's the optimal distance for you get to, to get the optimal volume. As you increase the size of that volume, or of that bubble, to get the same volume, you have to move farther away but in the process, what else is inside that bubble and what other kinds of sounds are now being picked up more than your voice? So even if you're in a poor acoustic environment, getting close to the microphone can significantly reduce how much reverb you get. If you are farther away from the microphone, even in a nicely treated room, you will get more reverb because reverb could happen on your monitor or your computer, your keyboard, your desk. It's not only about the walls and the floor and the ceiling. So with that said, what about using moving blankets as sound absorbers? You can use all kinds of things in order to try and dampen the reverb in the environment. The idea is make something that can absorb the vibrations. Audio is air vibrating or material vibrating. So if you can dampen that or absorb that, then you can reduce how much is reflected back into the microphone. Generally, getting away from flat surfaces will do that for you, flat, smooth surfaces. So if you're in an all-glass room, for example, that's a lot of smooth, flat surfaces to reverberate the sound and reflect it back into the microphone. But if you're in a library where the surfaces are all over the place, and yes, even though the individual surfaces of books and such may be smooth, they're at such different angles and there are so many different uh, angles going on that you don't get as much reverb if you're standing between separate bookshelves. So you could look at putting in bookshelves with books in your space. But coming back to your question of moving blankets, this is one thing that you could use to try and help dampen or reduce some of that reverb that you're getting. 
It can end up being a little bit awkward to hang these things up, but that can help. I'd done some experimenting before in my own space, before I built these uh, large black uh, acoustic panels, where I tried some foam, I tried blankets, I tried different things. And yes, there were some, some mediocre results here and there that it was reducing some of the reverb. Now that was with super cheap stuff, so I wouldn't really expect really high quality results. Moving blankets are pretty thick, and that's the idea of why you might even want to use moving blankets. They're thick, they're fairly inexpensive for, for how big of coverage that you get. If you're hanging something like that, I really recommend get it as close to you as possible. Like with these uh, acoustic panels that I have behind me and all around me in this room, the closer I get to them, the more they absorb my voice because I'm then hearing less and less reverb off of anything else. Now, there's not a whole lot of reverb in this room. Like if I turn off my, uh, my gate here and I clap, you don't really hear any reverb. Now, I hear a little bit being in the space, and I suspect that's mostly off the ceiling because I don't have anything hanging from the ceiling yet. But it's a manageable level. Now, if I get really close to one of these acoustic panels and do a clap, it, it almost is like the acoustic panel just sucks that sound into it. So with your moving blankets, if you're going to use moving blankets, try to hang them closer to you instead of farther away. Because the farther away they are, the more other places the sound could bounce off of, reverberate off of, and then cause more issues. So if you have the option of hanging it at a wall that's 10 feet away versus hanging it from the ceiling a couple feet away from you, go with the option of it being much closer because that will help reduce the reverb a whole lot more. And moving blankets can also be a nice thing that you could hang up on a whim. You could get a backdrop stand, like for photography and video work. Backdrop stands are usually about, depending on the size and quality you get, but you can get some cheap ones and some little clamps for around $30 or $40 for big or small. There are different sizes, of course. Maybe even $20 for a small enough one. And you could quickly pop that up, hang your moving blanket from that, record your podcast, pop it down, fold up the blanket, and you're done. Or you could get really fancy and build a whole bunch of acoustic panels or buy them. Uh, acoustic panels like this would probably cost two to $300 per panel. I built these for about 20 to $25 per panel, and it took way too long to build all of them. I'm not sure if I would ever do that again, but I might actually do that again someday. So moving blankets can work great. That you're thinking creatively about removing reverb already puts you on the track to getting that reverb out. Consider other things too, like even your monitor that might be directly in front of you when you're podcasting or your laptop screen or anything like that. Think about how your sound is hitting it and bouncing back into the microphone. Maybe you want to angle things a little bit more. Maybe you want to point your microphone at a slightly different angle so that it's not picking up as much sound from certain things. Like, for example, uh, some microphones, you may think cardioid is good because that's directional. So therefore, hypercardioid or supercardioid is even better, right? Well, it is more narrowly focused out of the, the end of the microphone. But that doesn't mean it's better in a podcasting environment. Like hypercardioid or supercardioid, those are really difficult words to say, actually pick up more audio behind the microphone than a normal cardioid microphone would. So although a shotgun microphone, for example, might pick up a more narrow focus of audio, it's also picking up more behind it. So like this microphone, for example, which is the ElectroVoice RE320, if I point it at my monitor like that, where now it's pointing directly at my monitor, this being a cardioid microphone is getting the least amount of reverb off the monitor, which is directly now behind it because this microphone picks up less back here and more up here. If this was a supercardioid or a hypercardioid microphone, then it would actually be picking up more from behind the microphone. So think about the mic position, think about your mic technique, look at ways that you can reduce the smooth, flat surfaces in your space. And moving blankets, yes, can be a great way to do that. 
Sylvie asked or said, uh, since you're no stranger to podcasting about TV shows, I thought I'd pick your brain on how one should promote themselves and their podcasting brand. Hey Arnold had a new, had no new content for over 10 years, but at the end of November, the show is releasing a brand new movie. How do I best capitalize on the situation? Not in a monetary situation, but how can I get myself out there and take advantage of this buzz to benefit my podcast? So this is those times when you get lucky with your podcast. You've been doing a TV show fan podcast for years. The TV show has probably been off the air. Well, in your case, Sylvie, you're saying that it has been off the air for 10 years. And you've been doing a podcast about that TV show. So you are feeding the fandom already with your podcast. And you're getting lucky because now the show is going to be relevant again. So here's what I would recommend you do. Contact all of your local news agencies, local radio, television, uh, TV, with TV and television, same thing, um, local agencies, uh, especially whatever network used to be the broadcast network for Hey Arnold, or if they still broadcast it, then contact that network as well and your local affiliate, uh, your local newspaper and magazine publishers as well. And pitch yourself as a podcaster who's been podcasting about Hey Arnold and what you can offer to their viewership, their readership, their listenership to get them excited about the upcoming Hey Arnold movie. You probably have made some podcast episodes already about the upcoming movie. Definitely continue to do that. Build up to the enthusiasm. Also consider uh, finding those communities that are about Hey Arnold and building relationships in those communities so that you can promote your podcast and your upcoming thing. Maybe even consider having a special party for everyone, whether that be like a local party where you say, for example, I might say, hey, in Cincinnati, we're going to rent this theater and watch the Hair Arnold movie, or it's a private viewing screening or anything like that. Or maybe you have endorsed viewer parties around the world and you say, send us photos, uh, we'll put it up on our site if you want to host a party or anything like that you could um you could leverage your existing audience too to say hey tell others about the podcast with this movie coming up make sure you're telling them about the podcast get them listening to it show them how to subscribe you could even contact apple uh, the podcast team at apple through podcastconnect.com they have their email over there you con- could contact them And let them know as quickly as possible because they work several weeks in advance. But let them know the Hey Arnold movie is coming out. We've been doing this podcast about the movie for a while or uh, this podcast about the TV show. And now with the movie coming out, we've been talking a lot about the movie. And uh, that will make our podcast a whole lot more relevant. That might give you the opportunity for Apple to list your podcast in New and Noteworthy because they would see your podcast as noteworthy. This will not result in a huge wave of subscribers, though. But it does have that potential because of the relevance. When people see that Hey Arnold is coming out this weekend, and at the same time, when they load up their podcast app, they see, oh, there's a Hey Arnold fan podcast. It's that connection of relevance and time that makes it better for you. If you're just a noteworthy, new and noteworthy at any time, that might not help all that much, but when it's front of mind for people, that can help you more. And then do everything else about trying to market a podcast, build relationships, talk to others in the industry, uh, bloggers, podcasters, also talking about, hey Arnold, look for ways that you can make a big splash for when this movie comes out and be involved with it. Have a viewing party, have an after party or something like that, a live stream for anyone who's watched the movie and wants to share what they thought of the movie. These are ways that you can engage with your community and each of these things can help you to reach a new community as well as these things might go partially viral if that's not an oxymoron. Jerry Batchelor said, I have lots of calls to action, seeing how I want to be a listener question podcast. I've been trying to tweak my show based on feedback, but that's the problem. I've gotten nothing, not one email or message to show anywhere. What am I doing wrong or right? Should I just stay the course or try some changes to get something? 
The first thing I would question, you said you have lots of calls to action uh, because you want to be a listener-focused show. And his podcast is about Walt Disney World. And it's uh, Ask Mickey... Ask uh, Ask Mickey something. Ask Mickey podcast, I think, might be the name of Jerry's podcast. So it's he wants people to send questions about Walt Disney World. And how does he get those? Well, I do have to ask, how are you doing the calls to action? Now, I know you can't engage with me right now, and I don't think you're watching this live, so I don't expect a comment. Although, if I see a comment, I'll bring that in. But if you are complicating the calls to action then that can make it less memorable. If you're saying, hey, we'd love to hear from you, call us at this number, email us at this number, join our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, tweet us with this hashtag, do this, do that, all of this stuff, that's too many options. And they won't remember all of that. Make it as simple as possible, even if it means pointing them to the contact page on your website. But again, make it super simple. It could be, uh, ask a Mickey or ask Mickey podcast.com slash contact. Now I know you're using the Libsyn sites and when you enter the domain for the name of your podcast, it redirects to a Libsyn.com site. So at least you're using your domain, but it would be nice if you could also make it so that, uh, your domain.com slash contact takes them to your contact page where it has your phone number, voicemail number, your email address, the email contact form and such in there. And you have a contact form there. And there is a very obvious contact spot at the top. Part of it, uh, and I mentioned this recently in a podcast, about it kind of sounding lonely if you're asking for feedback, asking, asking for feedback over and over, and you're getting nothing. So what you could do is a little bit of, would you call it guerrilla marketing? I'm not sure quite what you'd call it, or guerrilla something, maybe... Uh, Go to the communities where you see people asking questions and comment on the person asking the question and ask for their permission. You could say, hey, may I use this as a question and answer it in an episode of my podcast over at suchandsuch.com? Now, you're sideways promoting your podcast, actually, but what you're really doing is you're asking them, can I use this question you've already posted? Can I mention your first name, you know, trying to respect their privacy? so that I can use this in my podcast. And then when you record that answer, you send it back to them or you post back in that place to say, hey, you answered the question and here's a way that people could listen. So then in your podcast, you don't have to say, and be careful with your language here, don't say, Jim sent me this question, but you could say, Jim asked, because they did ask. They didn't send you the question, but you did get the permission to use the question. I think some people tend to be very passive about things until they hear other people getting involved. I see that very often with podcast reviews. When I started reading the podcast reviews of our separate podcasts that we host, more people started writing reviews. Even though we'd been asking for reviews for a long time, and side note, reviews do not affect your ranking, but they are they can be a lot of fun and can be useful for other things. So when someone hears that someone else has opened the gate a little bit or someone else took that first step that makes it a little bit easier for others. And then you can reference that. So maybe line up several of those questions that you can use from community people out there so that for the next several episodes, you have, quote, questions, unquote. Well, they are actual questions. So you have questions that you can answer, not necessarily from your audience. And... Uh, then that's helping you grow your audience as well because you're reaching back out to those people to say, hey, I answered your question in my podcast. Thanks for letting me use it. That can encourage other people to hear, oh, he's opened it up. The other thing is slightly a numbers game. How many people do you actually have downloading your episodes? And assume maybe 5% would respond to a question or would email you, contact you, take action in some way. So if you only have 10 people listening, it's going to be very difficult to get one person to send in contact or send in some feedback. So try and grow your audience and doing this thing of soliciting questions from communities could help. Or, you know, there is another thing is if there is a community 
where you've got some reputation or just you found a community that's relevant since you're in the Walt Disney World space, there are plenty of communities out there. You could post a question on there to say, hey, I host this podcast. What kinds of questions do you have about Walt Disney World that I could answer on my podcast for you? And so you could be then soliciting questions, and that could give you more questions than you know what to do with. And it's a sideways promotion tool for your podcast. So I hope that helps for you, Jerry, and thanks for the question. Ari asked uh, or said, need help joining a podcast network. Any advice? Podcast networks are tricky. I run a podcast network, Noodle Mix Network, over at noodle.mx, and I do have some strong opinions about podcast networks. Don't join a network if it's only run like a club. Join a network if it's run like a business. And that's what you have to look at it as is this is some kind of business agreement, not merely a club, but there is some business model behind this. Now, business model does not necessarily mean actual money is given or earned. But by business model, I mean there's an exchange of value in some way. There are agreements. There are expectations. There are provisions. You want to see that there's a structure good enough to support your podcast and that you can support the network that you're joining. For example, with Noodle Mix Network, I made the mistake early on of making my network too diverse. We've got a clean comedy podcast two podcasts about TV shows. Actually, we had two others before, but those TV shows were retired. So those podcasts were retired too. So at one time we had four podcasts about TV shows. We've got a philosophy podcast, a science fiction podcast, a Christian critical thinking and movie review podcast, a podcast about podcasting, two productivity podcasts. Do you see how mixed up it is? So then a couple of those podcasts are relevant to each other and they can cross promote a little bit. But for my comedy podcast to promote my podcast about podcasting doesn't really make as much sense. There's not as much actual interchangeable value between the two of them. You want to look for a network that has that interchangeable value. If you've got the podcast about uh, basket weaving, then you want to join a podcast network with other podcasts, not necessarily also about basket weaving, but about crafting or something that's relevant where it's very likely that the audience of other shows would be interested in your show as well. TV show fan podcasts can, uh, networks focused on TV show fan podcasts can sometimes be tricky with this too, because you can't really say that, oh, because someone watches this TV show, they'll also watch the other TV show and therefore be interested in the other podcasts. That doesn't always work. There can be times with that, like, Star Trek, for example, Trek.fm is one of my favorite examples of a network done really well. Every podcast on Trek.fm is about Star Trek. They have podcasts about the separate shows. They also have very specific podcasts about niche aspects of Star Trek. So there, there's a good assumption that someone who subscribes to one of those podcasts will probably be interested in the others. So look for that kind of relationship and relevance. Look for there to be some kind of actual written agreement. It doesn't have to be a full contract, although official signable contract is good. But look for them to be serious enough to put things in writing, what they expect you to do, what they're going to offer. These are the kinds of things to look for in joining a network. For example, what happens when you get a sponsor? Do you get to keep that money? Uh, what happens when you leave the network? Who gets to keep the website, the, the art that's designed for the podcast, uh, the episodes, that kind of thing? Who pays for the hosting for the podcast website or the media hosting? Who? Uh, what are the expectations of the separate podcasters in the network? What happens when there's some special network event? Are, is everyone required to participate or what are the expectations there? For example, with my own podcast network, each of the podcasters pretty much run their own shows. And on a network level, I provide their website hosting and advertising services for them. And the website hosting is built into my WordPress multi-site that has a bunch of plugins and functionality already built in. So they're getting a lot of benefit from that. And like if something breaks on their website, I fix it for them. 
but if they want to leave the network, they get to take all of their episodes because that's their content. They own that content. And if I designed their cover art for them, which I have for a couple of the podcasts on the network, they need to get new cover art because that's the cover art I designed for them being on my network. So if they're leaving to be independent or join a different network, they need to get different artwork, which would probably be appropriate since it would fit the branding of that other network or independence on their own. And their expectations about time and, and warnings and stuff. So make sure that the network is run like a business, even if they're not monetizing it. Like the, uh, I've got this right here, slightly stained, the Gunna Geek podcast network with uh, Stargate Pioneer and uh, Stephen John Drew and uh, several others on the network. It's all about geeky stuff. It's not a business network. They pride themselves on being a hobbyist podcast network, but they do still have agreements between them of how often you're supposed to publish, what's the certain protocol and such. Look for that kind of thing if you're looking at joining a podcast network. And don't expect the network to be the shining the knight in shining army armor, the silver bullet, the the magic potion or anything like that, that will make your podcast grow. With my own network, I've required in the past that the podcast must show that it has at least 500 downloads per episode before I would even consider it because there needs to be at least some leverage to use to grow it. I really don't want to focus on growing an audience from zero to thousands. I want to look at growing it from hundreds to thousands. So those are some things to look for and to consider if you're looking at joining a podcast network. Ken Cowan in the chat says, Hi, Mike Moody congratulated me on my new daily podcast about inside the podcasting business. It's at insidethepodcastingbusiness.com. Mike Wilkerson said, Casual waft of wanting a bar of quality on a podcast network. It's something I've always been in favor of. Otherwise, it's a wide open gate that allows quality podcasts, but also complete <laughs> uh, nonsense aboard. Uh, and that, that's something else to consider is what are you associating yourself with? Are you on a network where everyone else is talking into the microphone like this so you can barely hear what they're saying? Are you on a network with high quality and then can you meet their bar of quality? Do you really want to be associated with those other things? Because it's not the magic solution for you. Uh, Alexi, Alexis, I'm not exactly sure how the name is pronounced, but ask this question saying, I'm starting up a live webcam website. I have no clue what kind of webcam to get. I want very high quality videos. Please, I need your help on the project I'm doing. The best webcam I suggest as far as quality, price, compatibility, and everything is the Logitech C920. That's what I'm using right now to record this video. And you can see how nice it looks. In fact, the Logitech C920 handles my blue LEDs in the background even better than my DSLR does. If I point my DSLR at those, for some reason, the DSLR exposes them as purple. That's because of, I think, some kind of IR filter or something that's inside of the DSLR lens that I'm using, but I've tried some different lenses. Anyway, this camera looks great and works great, and that's because of good lighting. You can get great results with an okay or even a cheap camera if you have good lighting. Let me illustrate this a couple ways. First of all, I've got studio lights in here set up in my space, three different lights. I've got the strongest light over to my right, a weaker light over to my left, and then a hair light behind me. And I'll activate each of these. So there's that's the strongest light I'm turning on and off. There's the fill-in light that's helping to fill in some of these shadows so I don't look so dramatic like this. And then the hair light, you can see, is just giving a little bit of highlight like on the shoulder and off my shiny balding head. And uh, you can see, like, if I turn the hair light on and off, the slight little difference it's making there, separating me from the background a little bit. The light is that one. So this is a three-point lighting setup. Even with all of this professional lighting, if I turn my web camera into automated mode, this is the result I get, where now I'm bleached out, the camera keeps changing its exposure, as I move, I put my hand up here and it exposes 
according to my hand, I put my hand down and then it sees all of this black in the background and thinks therefore the scene is dark, it needs to be exposed, but now my face is overexposed. So this is the camera on its automatic settings. And then even worse, if I turn off the studio lights and have only the room lights, this is the result I get, which looks absolutely horrible. I look green for some reason. It's probably because of the blue lights behind me. So if I turn those off, that looks a little bit better, but still it looks cheap. This doesn't look very high quality. And if I do things on my screen, you can see the lighting change a little bit as I move things around, or you can even see it reflecting a little bit off of uh, this mic flag up there. So this is not good lighting. And this is what you might see with typical webcam videos. The web camera is having to work really hard to expose the scene and it's looking noisy, it's looking cheap. But combine this inexpensive web camera with good lighting and manual control of that lighting, exposure, color temperature and such, and then you get this, which in my opinion looks really good. And it's all about the lighting in your video. The first most important thing about video is audio quality because if people can't hear you, then it doesn't matter how good your video looks. The second most important thing about video quality is your lighting because as I demonstrated, you can get great results from cheap video equipment if you have good lighting and control over that video equipment. If you have bad lighting, then you're making the equipment, the video camera, have to work harder. I could get my DSLR out and try and do a video with this bad lighting and the video would not look all that great. Sure, there might be some nice depth of focus, depth of field effects and such, but it wouldn't look good. The lighting just wouldn't be as crisp. The, the mood wouldn't be right visually. So get some good lighting for you. Uh, you can use some CFL lighting, which is compact fluorescent bulbs. And these will usually be really big bulbs that come with these even bigger soft boxes that help diffuse the light so that you get soft shadows. Uh, those are really inexpensive to do the CFL route. You can get some really bright lights, a three kit, a three soft box lighting kit for about $150 off of Amazon. Uh, you could invest more into a, an LED light panel setup like I've done. This does cost much more. Uh, you're looking at $200, $300 per light. But what I really like about this lighting kit is that I, ha I can control it from a remote control. I can even adjust the brightness from this remote control. And they're much smaller and much cooler in temperature too. I, when I had my CFLs and I was using those, the room would get really hot. Even on a cold winter day, I would be sweating by the end of a video shoot because of how hot the room would get from the CFLs. Incandescence or other professional lighting would be even hotter. But these LEDs, while they are still warm, they're not hot. So they don't heat up the room as much. And make sure any kind of lighting you get is quiet too. It's not buzzing. It's not... Um, it doesn't have a fan on it making extra noise in the room. So look for constant light, like a CFL kit or an LED kit. Orange Clock Productions uh, on YouTube made this comment on a, one of the previous videos. How to live stream and what audio software to use? I have Cubase Pro 8. Can I live stream with that? Live streaming is a whole beast on its own. And if you're going to record a podcast, live streaming while you're recording can be fun. It can also be distracting, but all of the, the philosophical and the principal aspects aside, the technology to make this happen really depends on what level of quality you want. If you want to do video, which I'm assuming you do, most live streaming that's really engaging is done with video, although you can do audio only. But in video, get a good camera, like the Logitech C920, get good lighting, like the lighting I'm using, or other lighting that you can have, Make sure your sound is good too, that the sound going into your computer is at a fairly consistent volume level and you're using studio microphones. There is a tough compromise to make when you're talking about doing live video or any kind of video. Do you want really, really good audio? Do you want really, really good looking video? It's not a complete one or the other, but 
having this microphone here, this big Electro Voice RE320 microphone in my face, is uh, a little bit distracting and it detracts from the video. I've experimented in the past by wearing a lavalier microphone and I felt like that was more engaging because I had more free range of motion with my hands. Like here, I can't, I can't put my arm any higher than this because I would hit the microphone. And then there's not this big microphone in my face, or even worse would be if the microphone was in front of me like this, and I'm talking directly into it, and you can't even see me. Hey, look, I'm a microphone with hands. That's not uh, engaging at all. So whatever microphone you're using, make sure it's either small enough that it's not distracting, or you can move it out of the way. One of the reasons, um, one of many reasons why I really don't like the blue USB microphones, like the blue Yeti, the blue Snowball and such, is these are really big microphones. And there are a lot of myths and myth conceptions over condenser versus dynamic, and I'm not going to go into that. But with these microphones, they're huge, and they could be right in front of someone's face, preventing that engagement with the live audience. So try and position your microphone off axis a little bit so that people can see your face or see the majority of your face. Get a good camera, get good lighting, make sure your audio is good. If you're doing multiple people, then it starts to get more complicated because then you have to consider how can you give each person participating a microphone and have that stream to your computer? And what are you going to do with the web camera? You might have to position the web camera farther back so it can show both or all of you, however many of you there are. Or if you get even more complicated, you need multiple web cameras and a way to switch back and forth between them, which is what I do in my studio when we do our Once Upon a Time podcast is I'm using OBS, which is free software. It's at obsproject.org. And this allows me to live stream to Facebook, to YouTube Live, and to other places. And with that program, I can then uh, switch cameras on it. I can have multiple web cameras connected to my computer and switch between them. I can also do other things on the screen, like I could switch over to a blank screen or switch over to a logo or something like that. And I have to manage that switching while I'm doing it. And it's funny sometimes that I'll be really passionately speaking during a portion of our Once Upon a Time podcast. And when I'm finished, I realize, oops. This whole time, I left the camera on my co-host, and they're just there going, mm -hmm. and sometimes I can see my co-host giving me a little glare, like he realizes that the camera is still on him when it shouldn't be, and so I, I switch it off. So a key to being able to switch is put up keyboard shortcuts uh, so you can switch those things around. So live streaming can get complicated, but... It doesn't have to be. You really have to go back to what's the purpose of live streaming. Now, with audio software like Audacity, Audition, I think probably Cubase and such, this isn't live streaming software. This is editing software. To live stream, you need live streaming software like OBS. Wirecast is a professional program. vMix is professional, expensive software too. You could even do audio only like Mixler, M-I-X-L-R, or Spreaker. That's like speaker with an R in it. And if you want to sign up for Spreaker, then use promo code Noodle, and that gives you a free month. And Mixler and Spreaker are audio-only streaming options. So you don't have to worry about a camera, a camera switching, lighting, and all of that stuff or things in the shot. But you focused on the video, or on, the, on just the audio, I mean. Uh, and so to live stream that, Make sure that the way that this technology all connects together makes it easy for your audience to participate. Because the big point in doing live is to make it more engaging. So give them a chat room. Give them a single space they can go back to. Even if it's like what I do for the Audacity to Podcast live Q&As like this, I say go to theaudacitytopodcast.com slash live. Every week, that takes you to somewhere a little bit different because I'm using Facebook Live for these. So it takes you to that latest Facebook Live event. That's a 307 temporary redirect. The reason it's temporary instead of permanent is because I'm changing it every week. So I don't want it to be a permanent redirect. So you could tell people visit myawesomepodcast.com slash live Mondays at 2 p.m. And that's whenever you're doing it live and you redirect that to wherever it needs to go, whether that's YouTube Live, Twitch, 
Facebook Live, anything like that. Or maybe it's Mixler and you embed Mixler on your website or Spreaker or something like that. You're making it as easy as possible for your audience. For chat rooms, you could use Chat Roll, Chat Wing, Chat Tango. Uh, chat Tango, I think, is probably the easiest to implement and it's free and it works on mobile devices as well. Chat Roll is really nice, but it does cost. Chat Wing is. Uh, a little bit in the middle has some bugs to it some good things that other things don't have it's it's an odd one of the bunch really there are other tools like fly zoo and uh, some other chat things that you could embed on your site so that people can participate or at least feel like they're part of the community uh, you could even go the super geeky route and set up an irc embedded chat room on your site but that that gets a little bit too nerdy i think for most people out there and what audio software do I use? I use Adobe Audition uh, because I have the full Adobe Creative Cloud suite with, I use Photoshop and Illustrator and Premiere Pro and After Effects and InDesign and Audition and this other stuff. So it makes sense for me to pay the $50 a month for all of that software. If all you need is audio software, then what I recommend next is Hindenburg Journalist Pro or the regular Hindenburg Journalist version. This is designed for editing's the spoken word and works great for podcasters. It does cost, but you're not paying a monthly fee for it. And it does a really good job for podcasters. If you absolutely need something free, then look at Audacity. Chris Colnane asked about a free option, and I think that was about uh, Spreaker. Spreaker has only paid options. Uh, Mixler the same thing, I believe, only paid options. But what you could even look at doing with these things, if it's paid or if it's free, I mean, if it's paid or low cost, is uh, sign up only for the months when you actually need it. So if you have a seasonal show, you're signing up only for the seasons when you're live broadcasting and then you downgrade or you cancel the, or cancel the billing of it when you're not actually doing the live thing. That's what I do with Mixler. We don't need Mixler during the summer or during the uh, winter hiatus because there's no once upon a time on the air. And so we don't need that for our live streaming. There is also Facebook live audio. That's an option uh, that may or may not be easy to set up, but that is currently free. <clears throat> Dave Rex asked, besides show notes and premium content, what items should you have on your website to drive people to the web page and give listeners more? Well, Dave, you really have to think about why do you want people to go to your website? Are you just looking for the opportunity to give more value and then put that value on the website? Is it really necessary for people to go to the website? In podcasting and podcast consumption, it's it's actually very rare that listeners will go to the websites of the podcast that they're listening to. They have to have a really, really good reason to do that. And now with more and more podcast apps displaying show notes inside of the app, it's possible that they might be able to get your links, maybe even see your images or read your notes, follow along with your outline or anything like that inside of their app. So they have even less of a reason to go to your website. So getting them to your website, if, if that's really your goal, it's kind of a dead end goal. Why do you dig further? Why do you want them to get to your website? If you want them to go to your website so that you can sell something to them, promote that thing in your podcast instead of trying to get them into this complicated funnel unless you do have some nice marketing funnel but then even then you're not saying hey join my marketing funnel no you're saying join this thing or download this free resource get this extra value from me and so there has to be something in it for your audience a way a reason for them to visit the page and then make it as easy as possible Instead of saying, find the show notes for episode 200, well, that might be easy right now when episode 200 is the latest episode on your website, but what about three months from now when episode 200 might be buried under page four on your website? Look for what 
actual value is it that you want to deliver? If there isn't as much value uh, on your website in addition to your podcast, that's not a bad thing. From my own podcast, the Audacity to Podcast, I write thorough show notes. And I actually don't expect people to read those. I, let me say this again differently. I don't expect my audience to read those show notes very often. Sometimes they do, and certainly the show notes are available inside of their app. Most apps. But the reason I write the show notes and put the content on the website is for the audience that hasn't subscribed yet. It's for the search engine optimization, for the accessibility of the content, so that people can uh, find it, can consume it through the website. And it's okay that the most common comment I receive is nice article, even though I sometimes feel like, oh, it's a podcast episode, just press play, please. But I'm happier that they got the information from me and that that started building a relationship in some way. So you said besides show notes and premium content, what items should you have on your website to drive people to the webpage and give listeners more? It's, it's kind of the wrong question. I'm not saying you're stupid or anything like that. No, you're, you're asking a smart question. I think you should approach it from a slightly different way. Instead of trying to figure out what you could put on your website to drive people to your website, really think about instead what is it you want to give your audience and what's the best way for them to get that. That may be going to your website. That may be simply listening to the podcast. A podcast doesn't need a website. In fact, I'm doing this daily podcast thing now for National Podcast Post Month during the month of November 2017. And National Podcast Post Month has, has been going on for 10 years. This is a month kind of like National Novel Writing Month where podcasters are encouraged to release an episode every day. And I've been doing that with a, a little daily podcast I started called Inside the Podcasting Business, where I take you inside my own podcasting business and let you get a behind-the-scenes perspective on how I run this business, decisions I make, how I market things and such, and lessons and things I'm thinking about. That podcast has a domain, insidethepodcastingbusiness.com. There's no website. I mean, what well, takes you to the Audacity to Podcast? to the blog post announcement of that podcast and with the subscription links in there as well. But I probably, at least for the foreseeable future, won't make an official website for inside the podcasting business because that's not what I want to promote. I'd rather tell people, hey, if you want to work with me, if you want to become one of my customers go to the audacity to podcast.com or go to podcastersociety.com. It's not about trying to figure out what can I put on inside the podcasting business.com. It's about what's the best way I can deliver this value that I know I want to give instead of trying to figure out what kind of value could I cram into this? You see, approach the question from a different direction. Uh, and then glued to the screen said, I often ask about podcasting, dis about a podcasting discovery problem, yet the answer often addresses questions of podcast promotion is either a problem. Not in the way that most people think. That's my it depends kind of answer. Some people will talk about, oh, there's a discovery problem in podcasting, and no, there isn't. A podcaster might have a problem being discovered, but that's not a discovery problem in podcasting because the audience is the, one, is the group of people who really drive this medium, and the audience isn't thinking, oh, there's a discovery problem in podcasting. The podcasters think that because they want their podcast to be discovered. But waiting to be discovered is not the way to go. I mean, hey, I, it would be cool. I have in the back of my mind that it could be cool to act in a movie or a TV show or something like that someday. Hey, maybe once upon a time. Maybe since I'll be up there in Steveston where they film the, the episodes, maybe there's a chance I could be an extra in a scene. Probably not, though. But anyway, 
if I am just sitting here in my office thinking, oh, I'm a great actor, I'm a Shakespearean actor, whatever, I just need to be discovered. And I sit here and wait and wait and wait to be discovered. Yeah, I, I kind of have a discovery problem. And that problem is I'm never going to be discovered because I'm not doing anything to be discovered. You have to market yourself. You have to promote yourself. So discovery is the lazy approach that doesn't give much return. Promotion is the proactive approach that if you do it right, can have huge returns. I don't actually promote the Audacity to podcast all that much. What I do is create great content that's very searchable, that answers questions people are looking for. So, and, and I'm not just doing the, you know, if, I, if you build it, they will come. No, I'm, I'm looking, I'm researching, I've got feelers out in the space. I know what people are looking for. So I build it so that as they're looking for answers, they find my answers. So it's not simply building it so they'll come. It's building what they want, what they need. So this idea of a discovery problem in podcasting doesn't really exist. We have so many podcasts out there, hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there. Discovery is not the issue. Usability is. For the consumer to think, I want to subscribe to a podcast, but I don't know how. That's usually the problem they face. Not, huh, how can I discover a podcast to subscribe to? That's not what they're thinking. People don't think that way in general. Yes, there is a, an occasional time where people will think, I want another podcast to listen to. I love podcasts. This is great. What's another podcast I could listen to? Those people do want to discover something new. But they're probably not going to go to these podcast discovery apps and services to try and find something new. Most often, where do they go? To their friends to people they already trust and ask questions or even in communities they know. And they ask questions saying, I like this podcast. What other podcast is like this? Or what other podcast would you recommend I listen to for this particular thing? And they're asking people. So it's not a discovery problem. It's a promotion problem, really. And for podcasters, they need to stop waiting to be discovered and instead work to promote. And even promotion, some people will think, oh, I need to get into iTunes New and Noteworthy. I need to be featured in this certain thing. I need to be blogged about, anything like that. Do definitely make a show that is so good and so noteworthy that it's worthy of the coverage. But without waiting to be discovered, again, it goes back to that, engage with your audience. Go out there and market your podcast. The reason why podcasts like Serial This American Life and others got so popular is because they worked so hard to promote those podcasts. They marketed them to existing audiences and platforms. They didn't just publish a podcast and see, oh, hope this gets discovered. No, they worked really hard to get an audience for those podcasts. Like even uh, last year on International Podcast Day, I loaded up iTunes on my computer and I saw that number one podcast was accused from Cincinnati Inquirer. Here, a Cincinnati local podcast shot to number one. I got to talk to some of the team members who helped create that podcast afterward and discovered that, well, the reason they got to number one was because they contacted their Cincinnati Inquirer subscribers. They posted it on their already highly popular website. They had relationships with other news organizations like USA News, Uh, and leverage those relationships. So they already had access to a huge platform, a huge audience. So all they had to say is, hey, we've launched something new. Go subscribe to it. And they tell them how to subscribe. And that's how they got that show so popular. You and I, as mere mortals, probably don't have those kinds of relationships. We don't already have that built-in audience. Now, even for like with this podcast I launched, this daily thing, uh, inside the podcasting business, I, I actually don't know the downloads for that because of how clumsy Anchor is with certain things about podcasting. That's a separate issue. But 
it's getting momentum because I've been promoting it to my existing audience. So for the Audacity to Podcast, it gets three to 4,000 downloads per episode. Uh, my email newsletter actually has more than that. My email newsletter numbers-wise on it, 10,000 subscribers on it. Now, not all of them open every email, so it's not necessarily a super impressive number because they're not all completely engaged. But when I send out an email to them, that's 10,000 potential impressions. So because I've spent years building up a platform, building an audience, that gives me great leverage so that when I have something to promote, it can seem like that thing then skyrockets or launches with great success because I've already put in a lot of hard work to build an audience. When I started the Audacity to Podcast, I, I knew very little about some of these things. And I had, no, I had very little audience already. So when I got my first 10 downloads, boy, was I excited. And you might be in that place where you've got 10, 20 downloads, you're in your early days of building your audience. And this is the toughest time because this is when you have to do the most hard work to get one extra person. But hey, if you're at 10 and you get one more person to download or subscribe, you're now at 11, that's a 10% increase. Now start building relationships with those 10 people. Turn them into ambassadors for your podcast. Turn them into promoters of your podcast. And then you can see your audience grow much more after that. It's not a discovery problem. Yes, it's a promotion problem. You could almost say pro the lack of promotion is kind of like a disease infecting many podcasters because they're not doing it. They need to promote and not wait to be discovered. So thanks for the question glued to the screen. Michael Delaney said in the chat, Mr. Lewis, would you have a page of links to other podcasts that you listen to on your website. There can be some cool opportunities here for this. Uh, first of all, if you have competition in the space, or we could put that in quotation marks, quote, competition, unquote, other people who are podcasting about your same subject. If you post a list of all of the other podcasts about your same topic on your website, that makes you a leader in the space. Because you are the one brave enough to take a step in front of everyone else and say, I want to point back at these guys, these other people who do this great job, these guys and gals who are hosting other good podcasts about this same subject. I want to give a shout out to all of them. I want to make a list of all of these other podcasts. If you like my podcast, you might also like theirs too. That shows great maturity. It shows good leadership as well. And that's something that you could do where then you're pointing people so that they get a, a much uh, more thorough either education or entertainment, whatever it is that you're offering with your podcast, because they're getting more content that they might enjoy. And there is a sideways benefit to this, that when you are linking to these other places and you're showing them that regardless of where you are in this process, if you are the leader, you're the top dog or whatever, maybe you're the bottom dog, then when you point others to them, that makes your, quote, competition respect you more, and it opens up opportunities to collaborate on things. What this can also do is, uh, in addition to building those relationships, is for the audience, because you have a building relationship with your, quote, competition, this can give you more credibility as your audience goes to those other people, checks them out, and they hear those other people also talking about you. It's like Dave Jackson and I uh, have separate podcasts about podcasting. His is School of Podcasting. Mine is the Audacity to Podcast. We both have separate membership sites. His is more focused on launching a podcast. Mine is more focused on after episode one, although there is some overlap in different ways. We talk about each other quite often. We are great friends with each other. And... When I tell other people about School of Podcasting and they listen, they often hear me mentioned again. And that, I think, boosts their opinion a little bit more because they hear someone else talking about me, not only me talking about me. 
So that's one aspect, uh, one to answer your question. The other aspect, when you're talking about links to other podcasts that you listen to on your website, I'd say if it makes sense. Like if I wanted to post a list, and I've done this before, of all the podcasts that I listen to, putting that on the audacity to podcast.com it's not really the most ideal place because the some of the podcasts I listen to are not about podcasting. So it's irrelevant for me to recommend podcasts that aren't about podcasting on my site that's about podcasting. But I could post that list of podcasts I listen to in other places, like my personal website, danieljlewis.com, or I could post it on Facebook. I could post it on LinkedIn or somewhere else where I've got a list of here are the podcasts that I really like that I listen to. And that's a great way to celebrate International Podcast Day too, by the way, is tell people what other podcasts you listen to or at any time on Facebook and such to share some of the podcasts that you like. Uh, but a page on my actual site on the audacitypodcast.com, you'll probably never see me post a page listing all of the podcasts I listen to because it's not really all that relevant to the majority of my audience. Now, you watching or listening right now might think, oh, I want to know what other podcasts you listen to. And there is that little bit of curiosity, but the majority of people probably don't actually care unless I convince them to care. So that's it for the podcasting Q&A for today. Make sure you go over to insidethepodcastingbusiness.com and subscribe to my new daily podcast. Each episode is under five minutes because that's all the time that Anchor gives me to record. And Anchor is the tool that I'm using. It's very raw, unedited, authentic over there. Even my latest episode at this time, although I'm about to record another episode, my latest episode though, you hear me rocking my baby son to sleep. And there's the brown noise generator in the background, so that's why there's a lot of hiss behind it. And you hear me kind of talking softly, so I'm not disrupting him. And you even hear him make a little noise in there. It's raw, authentic, talking about the business of podcasting. So that's over at InsideThePodcastingBusiness.com. Subscribe in all of the podcast apps out there. And I've got a lot more content coming for that. Thank you for joining me for this live podcasting Q&A. I'm Daniel J. Lewis from the audacity to podcast.com.